Good evening. My name is Sheila Reardon. I'm the Minister for Political Affairs here at the Embassy of Canada. I'd like to wish a very warm welcome uh, to Professor Nodia. Um, great to have you in our, in our midst, and we're very much looking forward to hearing your words of wisdom a little bit later on. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Lipset, wonderful to see you again. Uh, members of the National Endowment for Democracy, and friends of Canada, really pleased that you're all able to make it this evening. Uh, this is the 13th such event, as I understand it, and 12 of them have been hosted here at the Embassy of Canada. And at least three of them I've had the privilege of being able to be your, your host. They say three's the charm. Um, so many of our events here at the Embassy are, are bilateral in nature, and that's for obvious reasons, given the geographic proximity of uh, the Canada United States, as well as the integration of our economies, etc. cetera. Uh, but I always quite enjoy this event because it allows us to take that bilateral relationship and the, the principles that we believe in and and look at it from the, the global perspective and engage um, in, a, in an international um, kind of dynamic here at the embassy. So very much appreciate uh, being able to, to do this uh, with uh, Ned. Uh, and of course, it's very fitting for the Canadian Embassy to host such an event, given the, the very strong linkages um, that we feel in Canada and here at the Embassy uh, to Professor Lipset. He, of course, spent uh, spent considerable amount of time researching and understanding uh, Canada and parts of, of Canada uh, and our way of doing, doing business. Um, he did his doctoral thesis on Cooperative Commonwealth Federation in Saskatchewan, and of course, um, uh, you may all be quite familiar with his um, work, The Continental Divide, uh, Institutions and Values of Canada in the United States. So again, very, um, very strong linkages there between, between him and, and Canada. Um, I must say that the National Endowment for Democracy is very adept in terms of timing for these events. <laughs> Last year, we did this um, a day after the election in Canada, the federal election. And I recall talking about that, that event and the results of the election and the fact that that was clear evidence of democracy at work. Uh, and of course, the results of those elections were not only a very significant change in leadership and players, but also in policy shifts uh, for Canada. And now, a week ago at a day, we had an election here in the United States of America, and uh, Americans have spoken, um, perhaps in some ways in in different uh, directions than than uh, uh, than the Canadian public a year ago in in Canada, uh, but clearly uh, a very significant uh, change in in orientation. Um, I'd like to read just to take a moment to 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 read or quote for you a statement that was made by Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau a day after the election um, last week. The relationship between Canada and the United States is based on shared values and shared hopes. And we will always work together. We are strong because we listen to each other and we respect each other. And the fact is we've heard clearly from Canadians and now you have heard clearly from Americans that people want a fair chance at success. People want to succeed. People want to know that they themselves, that their families, that their kids and their grandkids will be able to succeed. And we need to work together to get that. I think it's a very, um, you know, very relevant uh, statement, very salient, um, and, and it is an important message that will underpin and, and help us move forward as we, um, as we transition to a new government here in the United States. And I think uh, it's also very relevant in the context of, of again, of, of a, both democratic nations moving forward in ways 
uh, where we need to respect each other's uh, differences, but also the values, uh, et cetera, that we share. Um, the embassy has quite, as I mentioned, a, a long uh, relationship with the, the uh, National uh, Endowment for, for Democracy. It's an organization that, uh, that of course, is, is um, its goal is to grow and, and strengthen democracy around the world. We're vi we feel very privileged to be able to partner with you in this broad objective. Um, so with that, I would like to now ask um, President Carl Gershman to come forward, and um, I'm sure many of you already know him well or know of him, not only in his current role as President of, uh, of the Endowment for Democracy, but also um, his, his um, uh, experience or, or uh, previous uh, positions in academia as well as in, in diplomacy. So with that, uh, over to you, Carl. Thanks so much, uh, Sheila. We th want to thank the Canadian Embassy, <clears throat> also Niall Cronin and Julie Blake for helping us organize this and for sponsoring um, this 13th Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. It's a wonderful partnership, as um, Sheila said, between Canada and the NED, and I'm happy to report that next Wednesday evening, in keeping with our regular practice, uh, Gia Nodia will deliver the lecture that you'll be hearing tonight in Canada at the University of Toronto's Monk Center. And I also want to just take this occasion to note that Ned joins Canada in mourning the passing last week, actually the day before our election, of a great Canadian songwriter and poet who was beloved in this country um, and around the world, Leonard Cohen of blessed memory. I want to thank our other sponsors for th this evening, the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, where Marty spent the last years of his academic career, and the school is represented here tonight by Judith Wildey. And I also want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Press, which publishes the Journal of Democracy and the many volumes of essays that are associated with it, and it's represented here tonight by Bill Breitner. We're also very grateful to Ned's Melissa Aiton for managing the organization of tonight's lecture with her usual diligence and efficiency. Not least, I want to thank Sydney Lipset for all the support and counsel that she has given in preparing for this event, and especially for her assistance, along with Melissa and Brent Calmer, in the production of the booklet uh, that is available outside um, and that as we make a custom at these lectures that links the, uh, the lecture to Marty's scholarship. Uh, the booklet that tonight contains two chapters from Marty's seminal work, The First New Nation, um, as well as a note on populism that is taken from the introduction to that book. I know I'm not alone in saying that we badly miss Marty's wisdom about American politics and history at a time when our country is going through such significant changes. I believe, I believe that his theory of American exceptionalism has great relevance to what happened last week, though we all know that the trends here are part of a larger international phenomenon. When we settled some months ago on the subject for tonight's lecture, we knew it was timely given the Brexit vote in Britain and events elsewhere in Europe. The U.S. election has now made this lecture even more relevant. We're all trying to understand the implications for the future of democracy of such developments as the reaction against globalization and the rise of populism, illiberal politics, and what former Lipset lecturer Ivan Krostev calls counter-revolutionary democracy, which he links to a world of inequalities, inequalities, vast inequalities and open borders where migration becomes the new form of revolution. I'm quoting from an article by Yvonne that appears in the current issue of the Journal of Democracy as part of a collection of essays entitled The Spectre Haunting Europe. These articles are an important contribution to the literature explaining the new forces that are shaping contemporary global politics. And I have no doubt that Gia's lecture tonight will add to our understanding of this phenomenon. 
I'll leave it to Mark Plattner to introduce Gia. I just want to say that he's an old friend and he is cherished by everyone at NED who has had the fort who's been fortunate enough to know him and work with him. I also think it's important and appropriate to note that Georgia, a fifth of whose territory is occupied by Russia, has, all, has been able to withstand the pressures toward illiberalism that have affected so many countries in Western and Central Europe and the Balkans. This was made clear by the parliamentary elections that were held in Georgia last month, which represented yet another step in Georgia's de democratization and European orientation. There may be lessons here for larger and more secure countries. So it's my pleasure tonight to welcome Gia and to let him know how much we appreciate the steadfastness of his very beleaguered, but also very small and determined country. And now it's my pleasure to invite Mark to introduce Gia Nodia, who will deliver the 13th Lipset Lecture. Mark. Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, I'm truly delighted to be able to introduce my longtime friend, Gia Nodia, who this evening, as Carl mentioned, will be delivering the 13th annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. He is Professor of Politics and Director of the International School of Caucasus Studies at Ilya State University in Tbilisi. He's also the Chairman of the Caucasus Institute for Peace, Democracy, and Development, an independent public policy research institute that he founded in 1992 and directed until 2008. In that latter year, he spent almost a year in government as Georgia's Minister of Education and Science. And for decades, he's been involved in working on behalf of democracy globally, including as a member of the inaugural steering committee of the World Movement for Democracy. Yet Kia is best known internationally, not for his advocacy or his activism or his short stint in government, but rather for his penetrating analysis of the problems confronting democracy in Georgia, in the post-communist countries more broadly, and indeed around the world. In my view, he's the single most interesting democratic thinker to have emerged from the former Soviet Union. The range and the depth of his writings can be seen in the dozen or so articles uh, that he's published over the years in the Journal of Democracy. They've addressed the politics of both Russia and Georgia, the nature of post-communist transitions, the impact of geopolitics on democracy, and the prospects for a revolution in the contemporary era. But time and again, even when writing about other subjects, he's returned to the question of nationalism and its relation to democracy, the subject on which he'll be speaking this evening. He a first first wrote for this quest, on this question for the journal in October 1992, after having spent the preceding academic year as a research scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center's Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies. I cannot remember how I initially got hold of a copy of the paper he'd written based on his research uh, at the Kennan Institute, but I very vividly remember my reaction upon encountering that paper for the first time. I thought it was the best essay on the subject that I'd ever read. It was not only informed by the author's direct first-hand experience and sober reflections on living through the demise of the USSR. He concluded, for example, that in the Soviet Union, quote, all real democratic movements, save the one in Russia proper, were at the same time nationalist. Close quote. The essay also revealed a profound understanding of the Western tradition of political philosophy, with telling references to the thought of John Stuart Mill and Lord Acton. And in other essays, Guy has drawn with equal sure-handedness on Hobbes and Locke, Montesquieu and Tocqueville, and Kant and Hegel. Remarkably, Guy received his education in philosophy 
in Soviet Georgia. He holds a PhD in that subject from the Tbilisi State University and for some time was employed at the Institute of Philosophy of the Georgian Academy of Sciences. After writing a dissertation on Karl Marx, he was able to maintain his academic independence by working on such remote subjects as the philosophy of play and the philosophy of laughter. But in the process, he obviously learned a great deal about political philosophy as well. The journal's publication of his 1992 essay on nationalism led to a great deal of collaboration over the coming years. Gia's Policy Research Institute received some grants from the National Endowment for Democracy. He came to Washington as a visiting fellow at NED in 1996, and in 2000 he joined the editorial board of the journal. This fall he is once again with us at NED, this time as a Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellow. Gia's writing is always clear, and though he's not a native English speaker, he's shown a real gift for concise and arresting formulations. So let me conclude this introduction by quoting a few of these. First from his 1992 essay. Nationalism and democracy, he writes, are joined in a sort of complicated marriage, unable to live without each other, but coexisting in an almost permanent state of tension. Divorce might seem the logical solution to a Western liberal, but this option stands revealed as little more than wishful thinking once real political forces are taken to account, into account. Now from his 1996 essay on post-communist transitions. The greatest victory of democracy in the modern world is that it has become fashionable. To live under, under autocracy, or even to be an autocrat, seems backward, uncivilized, distasteful, not quite comme il faut, in a word, uncool. End of quote, but I must add, if only that judgment which was quite accurate 20 years ago, we're still true today, uh, we would be in a much happier world. Now from a 2010 symposium on 20 years of post-communism. Democrats should remember that autocrats sometimes succeed not only because they know how to break heads, but also because they address legitimate concerns that inept Democrats sometimes overlook or wave away. And finally, from a 2014 article on the revenge of geopolitics. Those who died in the Euromaidan did not give their lives for better ter terms of trade or handier, vi handier visas. They were fighting for a European and hence for a democratic Ukraine. So I hope these snippets have whetted your appetite for the full meal which is to come. And now it's my great pleasure to call on Gia Nodia to speak to us on the crisis of post-national. Gia. Thanks a lot, Mark, for this very, and to Carl, for this very generous introduction. I, it's very hard for me to express how honored I feel to deliver Martin Lipset lecture in presence of Mrs. Lip Mrs. Lipset. Uh, I learned a lot from Martin Lipset, of course, and I make my students study his texts. So now I, I'm here and speaking, uh, you know, in this to this audience. Um, so that's a really great experience for me and great honor, as I said. Uh, but I'm a little bit nervous about time limit, so I will go directly to the point. Uh, I, uh, uh, of course, uh, thought about, uh, you know, what should be, and we, me, me and Mark somehow discussed the exact formulation of the topic, but uh, the, we wanted it to be really... Uh, interesting and important at this moment in history 
and uh, I don't know how good the lecture will be, but I hope that at least this uh, objective was uh, really uh, met. Uh, uh, this uh, topic which I am going to, to talk about uh, is important, I think, for both uh, theoretical and practical points of view. Uh, on theoretical, I mean the understanding of nationalism and uh, the place of nationalism uh, in uh, not only in today's world, but in, gen in modernity in general, in modern development. Uh, there is a paradox, uh, a number of paradoxes about n nationalists, but one of them is that on the one hand, uh, nationalism has been one of the most uh, potent forces of modern world. Nationalism has largely shaped the world as we, n as we know it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, mainstream social science uh, did not uh, consider it as a central problem. It was quite a marginal topic of, uh, of interest for, for social scientists. And uh, uh, it's uh, some kind of puzzle for me. Uh, and this puzzle is uh, uh, the simplest impl explanation of this uh, uh, puzzle is that social science has considered nationalism as somehow a transient uh, phenomenon, that it may have been important in some uh, places at some uh, times, but uh, it's just a, a moment in history. And somehow these general forces of progress and development will eventually make nationalism uh, uh, decline or maybe wither away altogether. So maybe it's not so, uh, it's not worth focusing on it too much. And uh, uh, that has been a prevalent uh, assumption of uh, general liberal opinion in the world. I mean liberal not in narrow American political sense, liberals versus conservatives, but generally among men of enlightenment, which in American context includes, I think, both liberals and conservatives, at, le at least most of them. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, so the, uh, this created that expectation that progress will move us to some kind of post-national future, a world towards a world where nations and nationalism will not be terribly imp important force, even if, if uh, it had been important in the past. But I think, uh, provided uh, events of the last several years especially, uh, it's very hard to, to say that anymore. And uh, this means that we have to revisit those general assumptions, which made us think that uh, we are moving to, towards this post-national future. Um, and uh, uh, on the practical um, uh, uh, side, uh, we also live in uh, a period when uh, we consider that uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, democratic recession or decline or backsliding or maybe crisis. Um, uh, and uh, we want to explain that, how that happened. And although there is no uh, real explanation of theory about it, still there is strong perception that global resurgence of nationalism and global decline of democracy has something to do with each other. So these things are uh, interrelated. As, uh, and as Mark mentioned, I wrote my uh, first article for, for the Journal of Democracy, which is uh, still, I guess, the most quoted and remembered of my mm, texts. Uh, 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 on exactly this topic of interrelation of nationalism and, and democracy, but many things have uh, changed after that, so uh, it's a good time to revisit really uh, that that uh, topic. Uh, so I will start with this first uh, first uh, issue of uh, how uh, nationalism and nations fit into the general. Uh, context of, uh, of development. And of course, uh, although Martin Lipset has not focused on issue of nationalism so much, I mean, he had very insightful uh, ideas about the uh, role of nationalism in, in American founding, one could say, and I will return to that. 
but uh, it has not been his uh, main focus of his uh, his research. But I think that uh, uh, the, this phenomenon of nationalism and its importance can only be understood in this broad theoretical context of modernity, general development uh, in the modern world. And uh, of course, uh, these are the problems which has been the most uh, uh, most important one for Martin Lipset, and uh, in uh, exactly in this, he is uh, uh, one of the most seminal authors who uh, helped us understand modern developments in general. So, uh, uh, I said about one paradox of uh, 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 understanding nationalism, but there are other paradoxes. One of them is that uh, uh, generally uh, nationalism is understood as something modern, as, uh, as something that only is uh, uh, typical for uh, the era of modernity. So most authors agree, uh, almost all I would say, that uh, the era of nationalism and the emergence of nationalism should be dated somewhere around the uh, French Revolution, maybe a little bit earlier, uh, so in 18th, 19th century. Uh, before that, there were some uh, human collectivities or some attachments uh, that uh, may seem similar to what we call nationalists today, but uh, Again, scholars agree that uh, this similarity is maybe superficial, and in reality, uh, uh, nations and nationalists are something modern. And they also construct it. One should add here that it means that the nations and, and, and att attachments to nation, which is called nationalist, is something not kind of inborn or given. It uh, is a result of some... Uh, forces of history or some human agency uh, that uh, there are nations and th th there is this very uh, widespread uh, uh, phenomenon of, of nationalism as ideology as, and as a sentiment of attachment. And, uh, <coughs> and there are some uh, differences of nuance between different actors, which are very important, uh, authors, which is very, very important, and I will come back to it as well. But uh, as to, as to uh, how, whether this, uh, uh, whether nations are completely new phenomena in uh, uh, modernity or in modern world, or there is some linkages to pre-modern times. But generally, uh, there is this nearly full consensus on that, that, uh, that nations are, are only modern. And, uh, and the, um, the opposite, opposite view is usually called uh, primordialism or essentialism. It means that primordialism would mean that uh, uh, believes that nations uh, have always been there, that it's part of uh, nature of society or human nature, and, uh, we and essentially would mean that we should study and uh, confront nations as something given, that they are there as kind of uh, uh, objectively existent entities, rather than uh, something that is constructed as a result of uh, Human, uh, human activities and human actions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this consensus means that basically all, almost all uh, uh, scholars who study nationalism believe that nations are modern and, 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 and nations are constructed. So one can ask uh, who are then primordialists, why all books or all dissertations or nationalists start with cri criticism of these primordialist or essentialist views, but uh, uh, admittedly, while scholars are all modernist and constructivists, let's say so, people who are not trained in social scientists are mostly primordialist and essentialist. So, so-called common people, uh, 
think that nations are, have always been there, that the world have always consisted of nations, and we should uh, accept it as kind of part of objective reality. So that's a, maybe another paradox of nationalism, that there is very sharp difference between how social scientists view the world of nations and the phenomenon of nationalism and how everybody else views it. So that's a very big, big difference. So, uh, but that's uh, how, again, what's the consensus in uh, social science and in generally, let's also informed and enlightened opinion. But uh, on the other hand, one could uh, expect that if nations are modern, so uh, then they should be some, uh, that their emergence should be somewhat progressive, right? Modernity is also about progress and development. That's how we are used to uh, believe. Now the term modernization and modernization theory are not as fashionable in today's social science maybe, but it's uh, basically replaced by the concept of development, and uh, which is al almost synonymous to what Martin Lipset meant under modernization. Uh, uh, but we also assume that development should have something to do with progress, right? So if nationalism is force of pro modernity, it should be also a force of progress. But that's not what most people believe now. You usually nationalist is considered as something bad, as something negative, as something dangerous. Uh, and how, how can this also be uh, reconciled with uh, its uh, being modern? Okay, it was not always like that. In 19th century, most nationalists were also liberals. And there was assumption that, uh, you know, there is... Uh, so, so establishment, forces of establishment, as we would say today, these forces of establishment are represented by aristocracy and church and um, dynasties. Uh, and on the other hand, there stood people who uh, were fighting this uh, establishment. And nationalism was the force which mobilized people against establishment. It sounds a little bit familiar, maybe, but it's a populist fight against establishment. And nationalism was a force which mobilized this, this fight. And uh, as uh, Martin Lipset in that uh, text, which is printed in the booklet, which uh, uh, Mark mentioned, speaks also about that. Uh, he mentions uh, his, I mean, it's not mentions, it's topic of his book is America is a new nation. It's uh, being new means not uh, it, uh, as in the new world as opposed to old world, a world created by immigration, uh, but uh, it's new in the sense that it has been, uh, the, the country which has been created as a result of separation from colonial empire. And so, American Revolution, in that sense, was also a nationalist revolution. American, I mean, supporters for American independence were called patriots at that time. Uh, but and today we would say that patriot is more or less the same as civic nationalist, as opposed to ethno-cultural, ethnic nationalist, which is also understandable because uh, the difference, and maybe that's also part of American exceptionalism, that uh, Americans seceded from uh, mother country, from colonial empire of uh, England, but there was no cultural difference between them. So it was a different kind of, uh, uh, different kind of ideology, more liberal and uh, democratic ideology was something that divided them. So, but it was still kind of nationalism. So, and that's, uh, um, Lipset quite openly speaks so and uh, speaks about and that's why that allows him to compare America as a new country with those new countries which emerged in 1960s and 1970s after those post-colonial revolutions and also in revolutions which combined ideas of democracy and liberation and also nationalism as mobilizing force. Uh, so uh, so that's uh, uh, 
Uh, that's again part of this uh, paradox of nationalism that uh, on the one hand there is a big tradition of considering it a force of liberation, whether it is of 19th century liberals in the United States or Europe, or later and uh, anti-colonial struggles in uh, the so-called third world, but at the same time uh, <coughs> at the same time uh, I think the two world wars in the uh, 20th century were a turning point in making nationalism as extremely negative world in Western world, in the Western civilization. And so there was this post-World War II consensus that nationalism is something we have to somehow defeat or marginalize at least. Uh, uh, so how... Uh, uh, how can we, uh, again, solve this paradox? And, I, uh, and the solution is the same, as I said, that uh, uh, already that uh, it's about this transience of nationalism, this temporariness of nationalism, that nationalism, again, in the general uh, picture of global development, nationalism is considered as a something that happens, that occurs at early development, at the stage of early development. So uh, then nationalism uh, is uh, maybe necessary or unavoidable or unjustified, but as uh, uh, development continues, uh, as we uh, progress goes on, uh, it uh, should be um, marginalized or in, again, or in some, especially Marxist understanding, wither away altogether. So here we have also a combination of this normative and uh, theoretical views. On the one hand, normatively nationalism is bad because it's anti-liberal, it uh, opposes uh, individual rights, uh, rights of minorities, etc. So it should be rejected. But on the other hand, there is a theoretical, uh, theoretically based hope that it's not only should be weakened, but it uh, also will be marginalized because that's how history works. That's how, how it uh, also not only should be, but will be. So there was this uh, expectation, and, uh, and it, it was believed that... Uh, 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 we are actually moving in that direction. So, uh, and I think that uh, consensus that it's not, it's only one hand, it's a bad thing, it's only other, other, other hand, we are also moving in the direction of uh, nationalism was, uh, will be, uh, is a weakened and marginalized or uh, disappear altogether. This consensus was somehow built after World War II. It was that time, of course, when European Union was created, and increasingly, for decades, European Union was considered as some kind of global model of development. We have to move in that direction, not exactly, maybe, not precisely, not that the European Union will become some kind of some world union, but uh, uh, the, it shows the direction of progressive development. That's how it should be. And the European Union, of course, was deliberately modeled in such a way, deliberately designed in such a way to weaken nation states and make making nationalism less relevant than it, it used to be. Uh, but uh, uh, if we take this uh, creation of um, post-World War II consensus, on which basically the ideology of modern West has been based, I think, uh, um, <clears throat> or liberal consensus, let's say, so of the modern West is based, uh, then there have been several uh, blows uh, to that, that consensus ab about nationalism. Yeah, but we be, I have to note be before uh, de describing those blows uh, that, uh, interestingly enough, while post-World War uh, World War II world was uh, uh, the world of uh, Cold War, of course, of very strong uh, competi ideological competition. On this point, the both camps 
had the consensus. Both liberals and Marxists believe that nations are a thing of the past, that they are not important anymore. So there was no real debate about that. There was debate about something else. So, but uh, there have been several events that starting to dent this uh, understanding. Uh, I would say there were this first three waves of uh, post-World War II nationalists. One was this anti-colonial nationalist revolutions. Um, so that uh, pushed people to understand that nationalism is still important thing. It's no coincidence that the theoretical literature on nationalists has started to really proliferate since 1980s, basically, when this, uh, uh, I mean, the 1970s and 80s, but in 1980s, the most important books on nationalists, which are, we still t teach in all our courses on nationalists, were written by Benedict Anderson, er Ernest Gellner, uh, Anthony Smith, and others and others, John Armstrong, many other authors. So uh, that was recognition that nationalism is an important thing. But it really did not... Uh, uh, co contradict this notion that uh, uh, nationalism is, is a thing of early development. All those countries which were, uh, where, where nationalism was so important, as anti-colonial nationalists, were really underdeveloped countries. They were on early stages of development, so it was logical. If nationalism was important in Europe in 19th century, in late 20th century, it was important for all those less developed countries. So once they I mean, continue their development, then the nationalism will be as non-important as it was in Europe. Then the second blow to this view came with uh, communism. As I said, both communists themselves and st students of communism here thought that nationalism was not important, so very few people actually studied uh, nations of the Soviet Union, for instance. Uh, but it turned out that nationalism was very important for uh, defeating communism uh, and also it was a very important force in the wake of, com of communist defeat, right? It's some, as Adam Michnik said, that nationalism is the last stage of communism. So communists, former communists became not necessarily liberals, but they became nationalists. And this was certainly contrary to, again, assumptions of uh, social science that, okay, communists maybe had different ideologies, but they were modern. Communism was force of modernity, so they were modernized, developed. So they, they had not, it was not right that they became nationalists, but they did. Uh, so, and uh, that uh, problem, that puzzle was never solved, I guess, but it was assumed that Communists proved to be wrong path to move of modernity to, towards modernity anyway, so it's over. And uh, some scholars uh, uh, wrote uh, about uh, communist uh, nationality policies actually encouraging nationalism in Soviet Union, especially in Yugoslavia. So it was strange. Why would communists encourage nationalism? And that question was not really asked, but. The fact of the matter was that they did. So, so it was some kind of curious uh, side uh, way of development, but okay, that's over. Communism is mainly over, so we should not worry too much about that. But I think the events of the last uh, several couple of years, basically, somehow does not allow us anymore to, to continue believing in that thing. Especially Brexit, of course, uh, was maybe the especially heavy blow, because it's not some kind of underdeveloped country, uh, right? It is the cradle of uh, modernity, basically. Modernity starts from UK or from England, historically, that many people believe. Uh, and it was UK which took the first step in abandoning this kind of postmodern paradi paradise or paradigm both of European Union. So we may criticize it, and I was, was certainly unhappy on, in the morning when I learned about the decision of uh, British voters, but for me as an analyst, uh, it's more important to understand. And the, why is it that Britain was the first? 
And if we generally look about modernity and progress, the countries which represent it most are United Kingdom, France, and the United States. Yeah, those are countries of three great revolutions which shaped modern world. So in the UK, we have Brexit. In the uh, US, we have last elections, results of last elections, which many people consider somehow, again, uh, too much nationalism was there. And in France, we have fears of popular France uh, maybe winning elections or becoming very strong. So if uh, these three countries do not uh, conform this assumption of na nationalist decline, then it means that, uh, and of course, in many other uh, countries, we see the same, see something similar, then the uh, concept itself uh, has to be maybe abandoned, let's say so, and maybe at least uh, it sounds a little bit naive that that's the way we are really going to. Maybe we should be going in that way. Normative uh, aspect is there. It's another thing, but that we are really going in that direction as a progressive humanity, uh, it's very difficult to argue. So my attempt uh, is to revisit why we had thought like, what we got wrong. Uh, as Ivan Krastev, I think, uh, that's how he asked, asked the question in his recent article and his presentation in NET. So I think that's very uh, right uh, way to ask the question. It's not only why things are going in the wrong direction, but why we, what we got wrong when we ho hoped that they would be go in the right direction, right? So why did we think in the first place that nations would decline and nationalists would decline? So the most popular, uh, popular argument is economics, that there is uh, economic globalization, and economic globalization makes nations, nation states, and nationalists somehow obsolete and backward, right? That's very popular um, argument. And when I l was looking for the quote who, uh, of author who would summarize that argument, I found out that the best quote comes from Can Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx. And I will read it. Uh, National, and Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, I have to be exact, of 1848. National differences and antagonism between peoples are daily more and more vanishing, owing to the development of the bourgeoisie, to freedom of commerce, to the world market to uniformity in the mode of production and in the conditions of life corresponding thereto. So we had uh, read many published, uh, we saw many books published in 1990s after the fall of communism. Now the globalization came, economic globalization, but I, I would argue that all sorts of those books and articles did not say anything more than Karl Marx said in 1848. So in, in, on that point also we have this full consensus between Marx, Karl Marx and economic liberals or neoliberals of the uh, 1990s. So why, what was the mistake? The mistake, I mean, is there no economic globalization? Yes, there is. Is economic globalization somehow, does not it work against nationalism? So theoretically, yes. Uh, probably the core of mistake is uh, the idea of economic determinism. So it's not all economy stupid. So it's something else. <laughs> so now it is, uh, I think, growing uh, body of literature which uh, tries to explain why is that some, in some countries there is economic development and why there is not, uh, in other countries are still poor. So economic development cannot explain things. It should be explained itself. So some people now think that it's institution stupid. But uh, then what explains institutions, right? And we should go back to deep, maybe in culture or uh, ideas or contingents, some kind of contingencies or whatever. But I think one lesson learned is economic development, ec economic determinism. I'm, I'm sorry, does not work in that area. But there is also some assumptions on, on human nature. Uh, and I, uh, there are two main, uh, main assumptions which are 
One comes uh, from, I think, uh, this more continental French uh, uh, version of enlightenment uh, that human beings are primarily rational creatures. So, and uh, especially with development of education, we will be more and more rational. And so human beings can be understood in that way. And uh, uh, this rationality opposes irrationality, or but as uh, it is said in, uh, in Enlightenment tradition, prejudice. And of course, in actual era of age of reason, uh, the era of Enlightenment, uh, the prejudice was represented by religion. So religion was prejudice. So the uh, forces of education and reason will defeat religion or religion will become marginalized. Uh, and uh, although religion is considered pre-modern and nations are considered modern, but basically argument against nationalism is the same. That it's not, being nationalist is not rational, as being religious is not rational. Because why would uh, a rational individual be attached to some, I don't know, primordial sentiments or why is my nation better than other or why uh, yeah, I should die for this nation rather than other nations. So it's not 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 li really rational. So as p individuals will become more enlightened and rational, they will not be. They will stop being nationalists. So and, so in that sense, religion and nationally and religiosity and nationalism were both projected to decline in that vein of thought. But both those projections proved wrong. Religiosity declined to some extent, yes, but it's still quite important, as we see. And nationalism, as we see, is also not somehow refusing to decline. So maybe that's also wrong. That, uh, But it's good news is that in the tradition of Enlightenment, we have other, uh, other views as well, especially in Scottish Enlightenment. A person like David Hume said that the reason... Uh, is on is a slave of passions, a servant of passions, and it cannot be anything else but that. So we can. It does not mean that we uh, should underestimate reason, but we have to take maybe more nuanced at, at, at approach to to this issue. And also the other thing about human nature being uh, constructed. And again, I will. Uh, quote Karl Marx, not only because I wrote dissertation about him long time ago, but he, I think he formulated certain things which modern Western social science also believes in. So what we erroneously call human essence, today we would call human nature, is nothing but an ensemble, he used French word, of social relations. So there is no such thing as human nature. Uh, it is all shaped by environment, it's all shaped by social forces, so there were some combinations of societal uh, influences which made us nationalists, but there will be some other combination of social forces, societal forces, that uh, will stop us being nationalists or religious for that matter, and uh, all selfish, as Marx believed, and will be very different creatures. Not religious, not nationalist, not selfish, etc. So, that's, uh, again, not... Uh, 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 everybody believes, especially in the last part, that people will st stop being selfish. But general, this paradigm, academic paradigm of social constructivism is still very powerful in the social science, and it underlines this understanding that uh, somehow it's uh, easy uh, and inevitable that um, uh, <coughs> people, uh, most people will stop the silliness of religiosity or nationalism. But um, uh, probably, again, this uh, assumption is wrong. And uh, lo lots of contemporary recent work on psychology and biology contradicts this. I mean, one of the most very popular authors is St Steven Pinker, for instance, who wrote very convincing uh, 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 books on rejecting this concept that human hum, human nature is somehow blank, sl blank slate, that 
as Mao Zedong would say, it, it's tabula rasa, you can write all kinds of beautiful hieroglyphs on that because it's a blank slate. No, I mean, we have our inner demons and we have our better angels and uh, 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 this means that, uh, of course, there is progress, there is uh, human civilizations dramatically changed our lives, there is no doubt about that and we have to celebrate that but uh, uh, these inner demons are there or angels whatever and uh, uh, unless we take this into account then our social designs will produce uh, some very un undesirable or unexpected results and also some monsters maybe uh, so uh, this is uh, we something we have to uh, some lesson we have to learn from this un uh, wrong uh, uh, prediction about uh, eventual decline of nationalism and uh, also in nationalist studies I don't have I it was I mean for good reason that what I, I was nervous about of, of time management so I cannot talk about everything but there are different kinds of constructivism also, some radical constructivism in nationalist st studies of nationalism, for instance, uh, which says that uh, uh, basically nations are also created from blank slate. Ernest Gellner has a fascinating short uh, piece asking, do nations have navels? And he argues that uh, as God created world and Adam ex nihilo, so Adam ha did not have a navel, obviously, because he was created by God. So nations are also created by the forces of modernity, economic development, uh, spread of literacy, etc., ex nihilo. So it does not matter what was there before 19th century or late 18th century. I mean, let's say so, quote unquote, forces of modernity could be fully arbitrary with creating modern nations. He uses Estonians as a case in point, but it does not matter. Generally, maybe it seems that some modern nations like French people or, I don't know, Jewish people or Russian people have some, some linkages to their pre-modern past, but it does not matter. It's not relevant at all. So it's ex nihilo, really. But there are other uh, authors who I, I call moderate constructivists, and they call themselves ethno uh, symbolists does not a little bit more confusing term for me who say that yes of course nations are modern because they have never been this kind of large mass collectivities who have this attachment to their country and who consider most importantly that this being a nation is legitimating political order that only that political order is legitimate which serves my country or my nation. That's a fully modern idea. But there are something uh, in, uh, our, in history which has always been there. People have always lived in some communities which were, they believed at least, were based on common descent or common uh, stock. And also they had common language, common religion, common customs, mores. And they, it was very important for them. As John Armstrong, one of the representatives of this, uh, this school, said, the most important thing is the sense of bound, boundary. That there are, here is our people and there are other people. And it does not mean that you have to hate them. Sometimes people do. But that uh, boundary between our people and uh, other people have always been there. So it means that we have to assume that it's more probably part of human nature somehow to have to having this. Of course, this uh, in the course of history, the size of these uh, groups changed, the, their specific markers like languages or religions change, everything changed. So, uh, but the sense of boundary is there. And so you could not uh, create, uh, I mean, uh, this forces of modernity could not have created uh, these nations, modern nations, as very different things, unless there was some basis, some ground on each in history on the one hand and human nature on the other hand. So 
this is just quest for a more nuanced understanding uh, of nationalism. So, and uh, now about uh, democracy. I hope to get this five minutes still for that very important uh, topic. Um, now, as I said, we uh, think we live in period of democratic decline, that at least cert certainly uh, this period in which I wrote my first uh, article, Democracy of Nationalism, which, that was period of democratic triumphalism, if you wish, that democracy is going to strength of stre to strength, and its future clearly belongs to it. Uh, uh, but now we don't feel like that, for sure. And although there is no s great general theory why is so, but at least when uh, um, uh, we s uh, think about it, nationalism is considered something very important. So, Journal of Democracy uh, invited uh, several authors to analyze this, and its editorial kind of two-page in, uh, introduction, uh, uh, the editors uh, listed as the indicators that express this decline. So there were five things, populist, nationalist, nativist, illiberalism, and xenophobia. So it's easy to understand that nativism and xenophobia are basically aspects of nationalism, right? And the liberalism is umbrella term that says that it's bad. So basically it's two things, populism and nationalism, which are considered some kind of virus that hit, uh, hit democracy, and there is no antibiotic against that virus. Uh, right? it's, and nationalism and populism are not necessarily two different things. It's, one could say it's nationalistic populism or populist nationalism, because they are uh, very interrelated. So, and uh, uh, I certainly don't know how this anti antibiotic should be produced, but my question is, and my last point uh, will be, that the question we should ask about is, is this... Uh, uh, malady or this problem somehow external to democracy or is it part of democracy? So to use popular terms in social science, it is exogenous to democracy or endogenous to democracy, right? So it would be I, what most people mentioned uh, as a somehow general cause of this uh, virus are usually two things. One is about global economic globalization that somehow it turned out that this economic globalization is not necessarily good for advanced capitalist countries, at least for significant segments of uh, the population in these countries, because most investments and jobs go to, especially real jobs, let's say, so real sector jobs go to low wage and high uh, growth uh, economies like China and India, and here people who would have got those jobs uh, suffer, right? And that explains American elections, that explains Brexit, that explains uh, growth of Le Pen, and so on. And another is, of course, also quite contingent and certainly exogenous factor, which is another big trouble of the Middle East and a resulting tide of refugees. And then you have backlash against xenophobic and nativist backlash against immigrants in general, which is certainly true. Uh, 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 I mean, so certainly, I think there is strong ground to believe that it is a, a trigger factor for uh, discontents and uh, regression, whatever we call it, with democracy. But uh, I think it is important to understand that n neither populism nor nationalism is some kind of external to democracy. With populism, it's obvious. It's populus and demos are basically two the same words, one Latin, one uh, uh, Greek. And we say populism is bad, but democracy is good is a little bit paradoxical, I mean, linguistically at least. And I would uh, say uh, somehow uh, populism uh, is a uh, concept which we use to push to this concept of truth understanding, everything bad what, uh, what democracy has about it. So uh, somehow it reminds me of the concept of shadow coined by Austrian psychoanalyst Carl Jung. He said that we are, have ego, we have personalities, but we also have some 
bad things. We understand that uh, we have some kind of bad things in us, right? And we don't want to be like this, but we push it out of our personalities. And he calls it shadow. And but we cannot. Uh, but it's our shadow, right? We cannot help casting our shadow. So democracy cannot help being populist to some extent. Every democracy is somewhat populist. But, of course, uh, it's a matter of degree. Uh, so, I mean, like, uh, no time to discuss populism at, 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 length, at length, but uh, uh, <coughs> it's the populism did not come from somewhere, right? And nationalism, again, I uh, don't want to re recapitulate what I wrote in 24 years ago, especially because Mark quoted me on that at length. But nationalism is also part of democracy. It's not something external to democracy. In order to have democracy, you need to have political community of people who uh, wants uh, to have political future and political institutions together. This, uh, there have to be some kind of horizontal, uh, horizontal uh, solidarity of trust or something we can we call common ground, something which forces us to accept government which we hate, but we have to accept it because our people have has elected this government and we have to respect it because it's our people. If we don't believe it's our people, if it's some other people with whom we have nothing to do, then uh, it's not our government, right? So that's, uh, 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 so, uh, that's a problem. Uh, so. Uh, and in that sense, uh, while we obviously dislike and want to get rid of those negative expressions of populism and, and uh, nationalism, we have to mind that trying to expurge somehow democracy of this can be only achieved at the expense of democracy itself. So, and those problems, there is nothing really new about these problems which we're facing today. The 19th century liberals called them tyranny of the majority, right? That's, uh, that, and tyranny of the majority is, uh, as Alexis de Tocqueville said, and uh, John Stuart Mill said, and ma many others said, right? And it's part of democracy. And I think uh, some people, when they protested against Brexit, or protest it against, uh, keep protesting maybe now, I don't know, in the streets against the outcome of American elections, they are really protesting against tyranny of the majority. But what we can do about tyranny of the majority? Yes, there are checks and balances and transparency, accountability, but somehow it's important, very important, but not always sufficient as we, as we have seen. So uh, uh, 19th century liberals would say that maybe we don't need universal suffrage because all those not educated people do wrong choices, right? So maybe they should not be trusted with, uh, with those choices. And quite a few reactions to Brexit, for instance, uh, to, today it's sort of politically incorrect to say that democracy is and universal suffrage is kind of sacred cow, but I think people who were criticizing Brexit, some of them came quite close to to that, to saying that, especially uh, that uh, uh, they, at least one author, Mark Leonard, who is very uh, influential think tanker in Europe, he com combines that uh, ca juxtaposed idea of uh, diplomat diplomats Europe and demotic Europe. He did not say democratic, he said demotic, as if it's something different. And European Union was created by diplomats, and, uh, but it may be unraveled by the demos. So what is the result, uh, what conclusion from that? Okay, it's, I think conclusion is exactly what supporters of Brexit say, that the European Union is conspiracy of elites against the people. So that's how it sounds at least. So uh, what we can do about that? I don't have an answer what we can do about that. <laughs> but. My quest is for prudence, basically, that there is no simple, simplistic solutions about anything. 
also about fighting nationalism and populism in our democracies. Thanks. Thank you. That was uh, an extremely rich and interesting presentation. Unfortunately, we're only going to have a few minutes for questions. Uh, we have microphones on either side. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please line up. I'll take uh, Abe Shulsky first and Mike Allen second. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, quite rightly that the, um, in the 19th century, 1848 revolutionary, the Liberal Democrats were revolting against the supranational empire in the name of nationalism. And of course, Victor Orban knows people who, who, who champion Brexit would say that they are also defending or defending democratic institutions and popular sovereignty against the supranational empire. The irony seems to be that they were liberal Democrats in the 19th century, now they're clearly illiberal Democrats who are in the position of defending populist nationalism. Yeah. 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 Yeah
other cultures and uh, protecting our culture, not because it's our culture only, but because it also underpins those liberal values which uh, we enjoy in our in liberal democracies. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe apply some of your analysis to the question of um, what the European Union calls the democratic deficit, the fact mm -hmm. that there is this uh, feeling, as you mentioned, that uh, so much of the European Union, so much of what Brussels does is really sort of slipped away from popular control, leading to the kinds of phenomena you were talking about. I mean, does your analysis suggest that, in a sense, the democratic deficit is really inevitable, uh, at least short of the creation of a European nation that people would have a kind of nationalist attachment to? Absolutely, absolutely. I did not have time to uh, elaborate on this topic, but I completely agree. I think the very uh, um, core idea of um, European Union was a little bit linked to Hegelian idea of cunning of reason, if you wish, that this cunning of reason was represented by Jean Monnet and this kind of... Uh, uh, diplomats or visionaries of uh, European Union who were skeptical about peoples because peoples they saw that and uh, uh, demos is so to say they are inherently nationalistic and but we have to outsmart them by gradually somehow integration by stealth by, <laughs> by stealth that uh, uh, and uh, uh, so somehow uh, uh, move integration to the point when uh, to point of no return, let's say so, to some place where it will be impossible to go back to nation states. But it appeared that uh, uh, some people, I mean, well, maybe it was a great idea, but uh, some people just refused to get outsmarted and uh, <laughs> somehow said that, uh, okay, that's... Uh, elitist idea, basically, European Union, and it never became really something that uh, captured imagination of people. People still feel for their nations, and so some people say that European Union is a cold identity, that national identity is a warm identity, and European Union is a cold identity. Okay, maybe these uh, warm identities are, there is something, uh, some power in these warms. Okay, thank you. Well, it, it is time that we uh, brought uh, tonight's uh, event to an end. Uh, join me in thanking Gia for a wonderful <laughs> And now you're all invited to join us for a reception. If you just go out here, you'll be uh, able to find the way. Thank you all for coming.